Welcome, this is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives on May 19th, and we are welcoming in three students from the University of Vermont who have uh, looked at reading proficiency uh, for us at the request of Representative Austin. Um, Representative Austin, do you want to just uh, tell us about your process on this? Rowan, did you want to say something? Yes, I was just going to mention that the way that we wrote this report was uh, it was collaborative and so the, all three of us were working on it. So if you don't mind, um, we'll kind of be going back and forth to explain different sections, the sections that we worked on and the ones we know best so we can give you the best overview of the research that we've done. Thank you. That sounds great. So um, is that Hannah, would you like, are you starting or? Sure. Hi guys, I'm Hannah. Um, I'm a junior here at UVM, but I'm actually graduating um, this Friday, so I'm very excited about that. Oh, okay. um, so Aiden, Rowan, and I are part of a Vermont legislative research class, and we put together this report on literacy methods for pre-K through three students at the request of Representative Austin. And we started off by um, looking at academic literature, um, experts, uh, any books about what practices in literacy work the best and we gave a report of that. Um, and the big focus of our report is that only 37% of Vermont students in uh, grade four are literate. So it's very important that um, we get it right with the literacy. So we're going to move into some definitions to start. So who's ever next? <laughs> so first out, uh, or first I'm Aiden Neely. Thank you for having us this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be able to come and speak with you guys. Um, First of all, we're gonna be talking about the reading wars because that's kind of the frame in which this whole uh, battle is taking place. And basically uh, it's been occurring for at least 40 years. Some research, uh, some researchers consider it to go back even longer than that. So there's two different arguments for either a phonics or a whole language approach to teaching children how to read. And obviously this is a big battle and why we're doing this report. And uh, essentially to put it in simpler terms, the debate is about whether uh, teaching kids should be about vocab and phonics or a whole language approach where you identify words in your everyday life and then sort of learn from that. So the two camps are um, phonics and then whole language. So phonics is about like chunks of the word like CH or AE, what sounds those make and it's very structured, hence it's going to be used in structured literacy. Um, so that's- Hannah, Hannah, can you speak up a bit? Yeah, sure, it's, sorry. It's hard to hear you. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah. So you have the phonics approach, which focuses on the chunks of the words and how they sound. And that's focused on getting kids to recognize how a word is actually constructed. And then you also have the whole language approach, which is um, less, there's less methodology to it, more just kind of like how kids learn to talk. They'll learn to read by reading, um, by frequently reading books and by being put in situations where they're confronted with language, they will learn how to read. And before we move on to um, explaining structured literacy and balanced literacy, which are essentially these two camps, I just wanted to um, say something briefly about uh, the science of reading, um, which is a scientifically based research that's been going on for 15 years. Um, the most important part I think is that it's interdisciplinary. So it focuses not only on education research, but also on neuroscience and linguistics and uh, many different uh, ways of understanding how to read. And so the science of reading is, uh, it includes experiments and observation that's been going on for the past 50 years. And uh, all the research is peer reviewed and published in journals. And so it is legitimate research that we were using to put in this report to describe all of the different methods that we found. Um, and the science of reading, the main goal is to understand why people have a hard time reading 
uh, how to best help them and then develop the best practices and methods to address reading issues, um, literacy issues, and just make sure that kids are able to read the best way that they can. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I'm going to go forward with uh, speaking a little bit more in detail about structured literacy, which was obviously the topic of the request brought to us by Representative Austin. Um, so what I used for the definition was um, put forth by Lewis Spear Swirling. She's a professor of the Department of Special Education in Southern Connecticut University. And uh, to begin, structured literacy includes explicit and systematic sequential teaching of literacy at multiple levels. So this means phonemes, letter sound relationships, syllable patterns, morphemes, vocabulary, sentence structure, paragraph structure, as well as text structure. Um, this is a cumulative practice and it, it constantly takes ongoing review, which is the structured part of this. You can hop back to wherever students uh, may have gone awry or um, didn't learn completely one of the lessons. So you can go back to that and help them go forth with it. Uh, and this takes the use of carefully chosen examples and non-examples typically put forth by reading experts and they have different um, specific books you can give to these kids, which emphasize certain uh, letter sound relationships and vocabulary things. And it includes quite a bit. And uh, further, you wanna teach the kids the decodable text and then prompt corrective feedback. And it also involves a lot of um, teacher and student interaction. So the teachers really have to be able to care for the needs of the students as well. Um, if you have any questions about the phonemes or the more specific vocabulary that I used in that, I have some definitions as well that I can run through. I, I think we've, we've actually spent um, a bit of time on that this year. So I think we're, we're, we're in the, in the, in the structure, the different structures. So okay, uh, okay. That, yeah, um, they're not, they're not, it's not normal conversational language. So we understand that there are <laughs> specific terms that have very specific meanings. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, further, I'll, I'll just go on to mention a couple of the bigger uh, studies that I had used throughout our research. And um, the first one was citing Carol A. Denton. And this was a 2010 study conducted in 31 elementary schools. And it looked to compare the differences between typical school practices and responsive reading instruction. And responsing, responsive reading instruction can really just be replaced with structured literacy and the programs that go along with that when you implement it. Um, and the purpose of the study was to look at different uh, differences in phonemic awareness, word identification, phonemic decoding, spelling, and reading comprehension, as well as oral fluency. And the study found that on average, those who received the RRI or responsive reading instruction were placed in the 25th percentile in oral reading fluency. And in contrast, those who just uh, received the typical school practices placed in the 18th percentile. Um, further, 40% uh, of the students in the RRI group tested out of special educations after the study was conducted, those that were a part of the RRI group, as well as um, it helped with uh, at-risk learners or at-risk uh, English learners more specifically. And that's when you have just certain students who may not have English as their first language and they may struggle a little bit more obviously because learning a second language certainly can be diff uh, difficult, especially when you're put in different cultural settings, as well as everything that can go along with that. But um, this isn't to say that structured literacy is exactly perfect. Some experts do warn against strictly phonics-based approaches um, common within structured literacy programs. And this is just an opinion from the National Panel for Reading that concluded its report by saying, Systematic phonics instruction should be integrated with other reading instruction. Phonics should not become the dominant component in the reading program, neither in the amount of time developed, uh, devoted to it, nor in the significance attached. It's, a, um, it's important to evaluate children's reading competence in many ways, not only their phonetic skills, but also their interest in books and their ability to understand information that is read to them. And that's, that's the bit on uh, structured literacy. Thank you. We definitely spent some time looking at, at that. So appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so then I covered uh, balanced literacy, which um, Aiden was kind of talking about how at the end of that 
structured literacy shouldn't be the only thing that is used and balanced literacy is said to be this compromise between structured literacy and the whole language approach. So they're supposed to cover each other's shortcomings. So when you are learning how to read and you might know how to sound out a word, the um, whole language would provide you with the context of what that word means um, in reading. So balanced literacy is seen as a compromise between those two ideas. Um, however, it's not well studied because it's just this blend of the two. There's no specifics on how much structured literacy and how much whole language is actually used. So there's not a lot of academic research out there about how balanced, letter, balanced literacy performs against structured literacy. And some scholars um, condemn it saying that it's just the new whole word approach. Um, but then others would also argue that it's not a problematic idea. It's, it's a good idea. It's just been executed poorly and we need to have uh, more definitive guidelines for teachers so that they know how to teach both structured literacy and whole language literacy to have that actual truly blend approach. Sorry, I was having trouble with the button there. Um, I wanted to just mention a couple of different uh, subsets of both of these uh, approaches to teaching literacy. There are a lot of different methods out there. Um, some of them are really good, some of them have research behind them, and some of them don't. Um, I chose two that are, that are different, um, different from what I've seen. And some of them just have a little bit modification on either uh, structured literacy or balanced literacy, and some of them have uh, a lot, it's a lot different, um, such as one, one method that was uh, formed by two researchers named Dale Rose and Micheline Magnata. It was, um, it was conducted over a 13 year period, uh, nine different studies in 100 schools in Chicago, uh, affecting more than 10,000 students. And so this curriculum focuses on um, five critical reading area, areas that were uh, identified by the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, um, which are phonemic awareness, systematic phonics, uh, oral reading fluency, vocabulary, and text comprehension. And so this particular, uh, this particular program is different because it uses drama and music to teach um, literacy. It's, it's an alternative, not, it's a, an alternative, alternative arts-based reading curricula that's very different from the normal non-arts-based curricula. And so results of the study found that uh, when students were taught to read using arts-based methods, um, they had significantly outperformed their peers. So using those five different methods, the um, phonemic awareness, systematic phonics, oral reading fluency. And it was also helpful when they were in small groups and there was frequent feedback from the instructor. Um, and once again, it just, they outperformed their peers. They were, had the reading level was uh, above people with the typical reading practices. Um, in this case, they were also able to increase engagement in the subject. They were able to contextualize the reading a little bit more, which throughout all of the reading that I've done on, on the literature, that's a very important aspect of it is contextualization, being able to understand reading and literacy within uh, a subject or a thematic area of focus. Uh, so this study doesn't particularly mention, like I said, it being balanced or structured, but I think it was more of a combination of the two and it was definitely alternative to both balanced and structured because it uses that drama and music based learning. The second one that I wanted to speak about briefly was interactive read alouds, um, where teachers are really being the ones to read aloud and interact with all the students, getting students to be a part of the conversation um, it was, uh, I read an article by Shannon Guerrero and her colleagues. Um, it compiled a bunch of information describing how these interactive read alouds can help students to read, particularly uh, English learners. So students who didn't grow up or um, don't have English language as uh, English as their native language, excuse me. Um, this particular method improves contextual learning, especially um, because of the explicit vocabulary instruction 
um, there's culturally relevant learning environments, um, there's comprehension exercises to ensure that students are understanding everything, discussions with the teacher you know, as she's reading or as they're reading, excuse me. Um, and it can also help create more community feel, uh, according to one teacher that they interviewed for this article. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention was the idea of reading to learn or learning to read. This is something that I came across quite a bit in uh, the literature. And so in the 1990s, it first came up as the idea of uh, learning to read and reading to learn. Um, the basis is that in grades K through three, children are learning to read but then four through 12, they're reading to learn. And so that means there's little contextualization. And so it's harder to grasp subjects if you're not combining both uh, reading and learning at the same time. Um, there's research showing that skills and information that are learned together uh, yield the best results later on in schooling process. Um, and focusing only on reading to learn after grade three results in narrow skill development uh, and children who struggle to read particularly struggle if they aren't able to contextualize what they're reading or how they're learning to read. Um, Dr. Juliet Halliday at the university is one of our, one of the people that we spoke to. She's an expert in literacy instruction and K through three education in particular. Um, she recommends that teachers use contextual learning programs uh, and thematic curricula in particular to enhance learning, um, not just at young grades, because often in kindergarten or uh, pre-kindergarten, you can have specific uh, themes, such as top, off the top of my head, I'm thinking of dinosaurs. You can be have learning about dinosaurs and um, at the same time going through reading and literacy exercises. And what she recommends is that this be continued throughout um, all schooling before college, so uh, K through 12. Um, one other thing, I guess I have one other thing before moving on to expert instruction was that um, there's some difference in reading level as a base going into school um, based upon socioeconomic status. And so students with families that have a lower socioeconomic status or lower income may not, um, the families may not have the time or resources uh, to help students to interact, have students interact with books before they even get into pre-K or kindergarten. Um, this is just what one, some studies find. Um, and so it's not 100% set in stone that that's how that happens, but sometimes students can be set back because they weren't exposed to reading um, just by having parents sit down with them with a picture book or something. Um, Dr. Blanche Pojaski, who was uh, the former president of the Vermont Stern Center. Um, she essentially completely disagrees with this and thinks that even though some students perhaps may come in um, at more of an advantage than others when they're going to pre-K or kindergarten, um, if a teacher is adequately prepared and well-taught, has the adequate resources, um, has the time to dedicate to individual students, any difference in basic reading level going into kindergarten or pre-K uh, can be made up for, as long as the teacher has the skills and resources uh, to make up for it. And I just, we spoke to a few different experts. Um, Dr. Pojawski was one of them. We also spoke to two experts. I mentioned one, um, Dr. Uh, Katie Ravel and Dr. Juliet Halliday at the university. Both are experts in uh, literacy methods and K through three education. And so uh, Dr. Halliday, um, believes that there's a lot of good approaches for methods other than structured literacy. Um, she says that there's some evidence and the, she's some, there's some evidence against it, kind of like what Aiden was saying earlier, um, you have to be cautious about that. Um, what she's saying is there's these kind of the, the war that was going on that um, was mentioned earlier between the balanced literacy and structured literacy. Um, Dr. Halliday said that it feels like they're trying to solve a complex problem with a simple solution by just using structured literacy. Um, she doesn't believe that structured literacy is necessarily the right approach, um, but ling linguistic knowledge is really good and so that has to be incorporated into both um, and it just a simple phonics approach isn't good either. Dr. Katie Ravel, on the other hand, uh, believes, not on the other hand, I suppose, she believes that really a combination of both structured literacy and balanced literacy, so the phonics approach mixed with a whole language approach is the ideal way of uh, improving literacy education in K through three. Um, 
these she emphasizes that these two camps don't really exist anymore even though unfortunately that's not what we found in the literature that we read there's still quite a difference between structured literacy and balanced literacy and so what she recommends once again is a combination of both uh, and dr pojaski is a huge fan of structured literacy she spoke very very highly of that method um, but once again her most important point is helping the teachers help the students and um, just a quick little note that kind of supports what Rowan was saying, the National Reading Panel, which was created in 1997 by Congress, uh, did a study where they looked at literacy methods that were appropriate for kids age uh, pre-K through three. And um, they found, I'm gonna read the ones that they said were very important, alphabetics, which is phonics, fluency, comprehension, teacher education and reading instruction and computer technology in reading instruction. So their findings kind of support the idea that um, we need a breadth of approaches when looking at um, reading instruction. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry, do you, we have just a couple other brief, a couple other comments if you don't mind. Okay, good, yeah. Um, we have to go to the floor pretty soon, so I just want to <laughs> yeah, a couple more minutes. Yeah, we were just going to mention um, we looked into two different states, um, Michigan and Massachusetts, um, and just looked at their and practices. We included um, we included the links to what they've developed in our report. So if anyone's interested in looking at that, they're there. Um, since we're running a little short on time, I we probably won't go through all of it, um, but. The reports use both structured and balanced literacy to develop uh, better methods that they've been able to start practicing in both Michigan and Massachusetts. Uh, and I just wanted to make that quick comment. Thank you. We, I know we do have some folks that came in who, who do teach, uh, use the balanced literacy approach, and we certainly heard um, structured literacy as well, probably leaving us with um, that feeling that structured literacy was a necessary, but not perhaps not a sufficient condition. And there's a combination of bottom up and top down kind, kinds of thinking. Um, we have just a couple of minutes. I just want to make sure that you know an opportunity for some questions. I'm cu so curious how you ended up uh, agreeing to this topic. Or if any of you are considering being teachers or anything. So um, maybe, yeah, Aiden. Uh, personally, my sister, she works in Massachusetts as a uh, kindergarten teacher in the town that she works in. I know um, it's it's very like socioeconomically, they're not in the greatest shape. And they also struggle with having a lot of children that come in that um, previously have never learned English. So this was kind of a passionate topic for me. My aunt is also a principal. And uh, she was very curious on it. And it, I don't know, it, it just was something that personally to me, I felt was pretty interesting and I enjoyed learning about it. And I know that there's a lot of pitfalls uh, and a lot of struggle within teachers and, and they have a pretty difficult job. So it'd be nice to set things up where it's a little bit easier. And the more skills a teacher has in his or her hand, <laughs> their hand, the more likely they are to be able to respond to the child in front of them. Hannah, what about you? Um, I studied environmental studies at UVM, so this is totally out of my element. I have never done anything with education or literacy, and since it was my last semester here, I kind of just wanted to try something new. Um, I definitely Thank think you. it's super important for kids, and especially if we're going to save the planet, uh, they need to know how to read and take care of it. <laughs> Good connection. <laughs> and Rowan? I also study environmental studies and political science, and I'm interested in environmental education. And so I had a little bit of interest in education, but this was really, really interesting to learn about. And I really enjoyed doing this report. I think, um, I think I got a lot out of it. And it's definitely helped me reevaluate how I see education and how much I value it. Yeah. The skill of the teacher, <laughs> what it takes to be a good teacher. Yeah, uh, Representative Austin, last last question. Yeah, no question. Just want to say thank you so much and wishing the three of you the best of luck. I really appreciate the work you did. I was very impressed, so thank you. And I know the committee thanks you as well. 
And I, I also want to just remind our committee members that uh, this is a resource uh, available to us. And we have got a bunch of questions coming forward, whether it's environmental issues in, in our school buildings, um, whether it's meals that we're looking at. Um, there, there are a variety of things. So if there's some time before we end the session, let's, let's have a little conversation, see how we might um, use this group again. Uh, to, to do this work. Um, it's a great, great service to us. And um, we get to meet amazing students who take this on. So thank you so much. I'm looking, I've got the report up here right now. I see you did have Massachusetts. I'm sure Aiden, that might've had something to do with, with, with your interest as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Thank you so much, the three of you. And, you. and with that, we're, we'll be heading back to the floor. I just wanted to give you one, uh, uh, the committee one minute to just tell you what's what's coming forward. Um, I am looking into um, uh, helping to build a little background on some of the, the complex uh, questions before us related to education funding. Um, the OPEB conversation is one. And so I have invited, we have invited in, um, Chris Roop, who's been working on this with, um, with the various players uh, related to pensions, um, to talk to us about the OPEB, and as well as um, uh, JFO to talk about implications to the Ed Fund. And I know that Ways and Means is right now looking at this issue. They've got an, they're looking at some possible options. Um, I, I probably will watch that testimony later. I think they were looking at the possibility of of um, well, I'll wait. I, I don't know if I don't know if they've actually put that forward yet or not. But they're looking at a potential um, financial resource to pay for uh, the OPEB. So, and uh, I'll let you know when it was just the, the whatever the most recent um, ways and means conversation that should be there. And with that, I guess we can head back to the floor. Um, I guess S-115 is on notice. Um, Representative Conlin, uh, are, you, are you prepared to do that or were you gonna leave that to me? He's, he's involved in some other things, so I won't, I won't, <laughs> I'll get hi, hi, Kate, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I think for uh, safety purposes, if you could uh, yeah. present the last minute amendment, that would be great. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Hey, okay, everybody, we will head to the floor. Thank you so much, Thank students, for your Thank good you work. Students. Good Great luck. Information.